The Hatha Yoga project is a, a five-year research project funded by the European Research Council and the aim of it is to, to map, to trace the history of physical yoga practice right up to the um, present day but present day sort of traditional practice amongst ascetic yogis in India uh, and we use two primary methodologies so one is the kind of the study of texts so at the very heart of the project we are going to produce 10 critical editions of uh, important texts on physical yoga practice. The oldest one is about a thousand years old and the youngest one probably 200 to 250. Uh, and that involves finding all the manuscripts of each text and comparing them, then producing what we think was an early form of the text, translating it and introducing it and, and providing notes for it. Um, so that's one methodology. And then the other primary methodology is what we call ethnography. So that involves going to India to uh, meet you know, living traditional practitioners of yoga. And then in addition to that uh, sort of important but um, less uh, focused methodology we use is looking at art historical materials in India. But that's because that's very, it's, it's proven extremely useful for tracing the history of, of physical yoga practices because we see, for example, we see balancing postures suddenly appearing on temple walls at the same time as they suddenly start appearing in text. So that suggests that something new is, is going on. Okay, so I'm I'm what's called the, the PI, the Principal Investigator of the project, so I proposed it originally. Um, I've been studying Sanskrit for gosh, too long now, 30 years or more since I was 17, 18. And I went to India when I was 17 and just and had a wonderful time. Then I've been back every year since. I became fascinated by the, the living world of the traditional ascetics. But I always kind of, you know, I've resisted the temptation to become one myself and I've balanced that fascination with academic study of, of the subject. And I ended up using my Sanskrit training for my PhD to study, to, to produce a critical uh, edition of a text called the Ketri Vidya, um, because I was looking for a Sanskrit text that was relevant to the world of the yogis and sadhus I was living with in India. And in fact, the only ones that are really relevant, the only Sanskrit texts that are really relevant, are the ones on Hatha Yoga. Uh, so that's what sent me down that path. Uh, and at the end of that, uh, doing my PhD, I then realised that what I'd read previously about the general history of Hatha Yoga, physical yoga more, more generally understood, really didn't match what I was seeing in that text and in other texts and manuscripts that I'd looked at. So it became my dream, this would have been in around 2002, I suppose, uh, to study the subject more broadly. And that, that's kind of probably when the first, I, I suppose then I wasn't thinking about a, a formal research project, but I kind of knew that the only way to understand this history was to look at all the texts again and, and reassess and find there are more texts. Because until now, until this project really, or until uh, you know, I'm working on the Kitri Vidya, the history of physical yoga had really been based on translations, not even critical editions, of three texts, the Hatha Pradipika, the Gelanda Sangita and the Shiva Sangita. And of course there are many more texts that are important and then of course there's the other, you know, the art historical material which can, as I said, be complemented by the uh, ethnographic data as well. So in order to really understand the history it became apparent to me that a lot more study had to be done and pretty quickly I realised I wasn't going to be able to do it all myself. Um, and so I slowly developed the idea for a research project. I did propose it to the AHRC, which is the UK kind of funding body. I think I did that in 2012, 2013, and it got very good reviews, but was rejected. I can't remember why, you know, it got the sort of top marks, but poss possibly because I was coming from nowhere. I didn't have a proper job at the time. I'd just finished a big translation project. And then as soon as I, so I got the job here in 2013 at, at SOAS in, in London, and that makes it easier to apply for one of these big projects. So as soon as I had a, a pucker permanent job, again, I, and I went for the sort of, you know, the biggest uh, uh, grant you can get, which is European Research Council, and I got lucky. Um, I assembled a, a fantastic team. And one thing I've really learned 
doing this project. Well, maybe, I mean, I suppose I haven't, well, it's a, a very small thing to have learned, but it's a good thing to have learned, is that uh, you don't really need to be much of a manager if you've got very good people on your team. So I've been very lucky that I've been able to let everyone else kind of get on uh, with, with what they want to do. I've trusted them completely and they've all, you know, produced fantastic work. I think it's a fairly unique project in that way, in the academic world, in that everyone was named, you know, all the researchers were named because we've all got very specialist skills. Um, Daniela, for example, you know, I, I, she wasn't named in the very first draft of the project. In fact, she wasn't named when I got approval, but I very quickly realised that she was the only person around who was going to be capable of doing what we needed to be done for the project because she's already spent uh, years in India living with ascetics. She speaks very good Hindi. She's a very fearless, brave, formidable lady, and you know she would be able to cope with the stresses and rigours of uh, ethnographic fieldwork. And sure enough, she spent, I think, more than two years in India traveling around and living with, with, with yogis. And so I don't, think there's, I don't think there's any other scholar that would have been prepared, you know, in a position to be able to do that. So I, I rang her up soon after I got the grant proposal and said, hey, Daniela, you know, do you want to do this? And she said, sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was great. And then, of course, Mark um, Singleton is, you know, his, his, uh, it was his book. So I spent years in India living with traditional yogis um, and understanding to a great extent there what, how they understood yoga and yoga practice and how they did it. But I really couldn't work out how that connected completely with what I was seeing in the West as yoga practice in yoga studios and so forth. So it wasn't until I read Mark's book, and we were already friends at that point, um, I read Yoga Body and that became clear. And so he was perfect to bring in to try to link up what we would be finding in our research with uh, the, the world of modern yoga. And then Jason, Jason Birch, he, in fact, I examined his PhD thesis in Oxford, I think it was 2011, perhaps. Um, and, you know, he's an extremely dedicated, uh, solid, rigorous philologist like me, as I've trained to be. So he was supervised, he had the same supervisor at Oxford as, as I did, Alexis Sarnison, Professor Alexis Sarnison. And he was, uh, I don't know if he still is, I don't think he's quite as hungry as he was as he, uh, I don't think he's quite as hungry now as he was for, the hard work of travelling around India, going to all the manuscript libraries, but he did an amazing job of that through the course of the project. He's got the, the patience of a, a saint, maybe the yoga's paying off in that respect, because it can be very frustrating work. So he, and together with his, his wife Jackie, they've, they've spent years of the project travelling around India, going to libraries and getting these manuscripts, which are the crucial raw material for our, for our work. So, yeah, and, and of course he's, you know, he's a yoga specialist, so that, you know, despite yoga's um, amazing popularity, there are and yoga studies is beginning to really take off. But no kind of philologist, no no scholars trained in the study of manuscripts and producing critical editions of Sanskrit texts have really focused on it before. Um, actually, there's one Frenchman, uh, Christian Bouy, who was based at the Collège de France. Sadly, he he died probably 15 years ago. But it was his. He wrote a book called Les Nata Yoga et les Upanishads, uh, which was published in 1994. And that was a very uh, scholarly, heavy, dense study of all the different uh, Hatha Yoga texts and how they relate to the later Yoga Upanishads. And it was actually through reading his work that I identified the Ketri Vidya uh, as being a text suitable to work on in my PhD. Um, so actually, yeah, I think to his, I definitely give your your countryman, your compatriot, Christian Bui, credit as being the first kind of serious philologist to, to focus on, on Hatha Yoga texts. And then a lot of our work has sprung from that. And in fact, actually, um, Jason and uh, a French colleague, Christelle Barwa, Dr. Barwa, who's currently based in Vienna, they have translated Christian Bui's book into, into English. Mm -hmm. The yeah, fieldwork, so as I said, we've had these two primary methodologies of texts and then interviews fieldwork with traditional yogis in India. And that's something, you know, I've been doing basically since I started my, my studies, but in a rather informal way. Um, and I included that in my PhD thesis, but to a small enough degree that I didn't really have to go through the whole kind of you know, justify my 
anthropological methodology and all that kind of thing. And I knew that to do to include uh, ethnographic anthropological fieldwork in this project would require some more uh, critical analysis of methodology and so forth that I'm not really capable of, which is why uh, we got Daniela on board. Um, and then, so what she has been doing, and she spent, I think, more than two years, is traveling around, going to festivals, temples, ashrams, where she knew that traditional ascetics would be, and then asking among them if there's any practitioners of, of yoga, of Hatha yoga in particular, and then sitting down with them. You have to be very patient, you know, there's, it's, it's a, still quite a, a secret tradition amongst these uh, ascetic lineages, so you have to win their faith, their, their confidence that you're, you know, that you're, you're worthy of being told some of their, their, their teachings. And, and, but she also did it very um, rigorously, very structured. She would have a, a set of questions that she would ask every uh, ascetic that she managed to win over who would agree to be interviewed by her. Um, and so she's you know, got hours and hours and hours of tapes of interviews and so forth. And it's through that that we get an understanding of how physical yoga is practiced by these ascetics, why they do it, and then how it relates. You know, in some ways it, it reflects and is similar to what we find in the text, but in other ways it's different. And then we try to make, make sense of that as well. We are, sadly, we're in the, you know, the final year of the project. We've only got about nine months to go. And in fact, the vast amount, almost all of the research, you know, the gathering of data is complete. We have got all the manuscripts we need. We have working critical editions and translations of all the texts. Maybe one is, we're going to have one more small workshop on one of the texts, the Hatha Sanketa Chandrika. Uh, we're not planning... Any, well, actually, no, we're planning one more fieldwork trip, which I'm rather excited about. Daniela and I are going to go to Pakistan at the end of February. Um, I've never been before. I must have been to India 50 times or something, I don't know. But there are still, you know, there are sites in Pakistan that were very important to the yogi traditions before partition. And uh, no scholars of yoga or the history of yoga that I'm aware of have visited them since since partition. So I'm hoping, I mean, I'm, I'm going with low expectations because who knows what we'll find. They may have been defaced or, in fact, some of them are still functioning as Hindu temples because there's a few Hindus still in Pakistan, but I think they may have perhaps effaced, got rid of all the you know, historical signs, but maybe, hopefully, and this is one of my, you know, one of the things we've learned from the project is often you just go to somewhere and even if you're not sure what you might find, often it will stimulate you in some way or you'll find something that you weren't expecting at all. For example, one of the great finds of the project uh, was at this place called Daboy in Gujarat where Daniela and I were on our way from, we were in, through, going up from Gujarat up to Madhya Pradesh, it was a Kumbh Mela Ujjain and this place Daboy was kind of en route and I'd read in one quite obscure Hindi article that there were some interesting uh, sculptures of Nath yogis on the inside of this big you know, 25 foot high gate. So we thought we'd have a look and sure enough these sculptures were amazing but then there were two more layers of amazing sculptures of yoga knees and uh, then Bhairava, the fierce form of Shiva with, with the goddess and they were about this high and fantastically detailed and this place, this uh, gate dates to 1230 uh, AD and Daniel then looked up and on the roof of it, the 84 yogis in various complex asanas and uh, you know different postures, and they, that's the, those are the earliest depictions of postures like that by about 300 years. Prior to that, we thought we only knew about the ones at Hampi, and Sri Shailam and Sringeri, which all date to about 1500. So suddenly, you know, we were able to move this back, and in fact, that that then ties in very nicely with. Um, our textual evidence, because there's a Jain text, not that we're not we're working on the project, but is an important text in the history of physical yoga by a scholar called Hemachandra, who lived not very far away from Daboy, and he lived just a little bit before the gate was built, and he's the first person to write about headstands and those sort of complex asanas mm -hmm. in a Sanskrit text, and then meanwhile we see them appearing on a 
uh, on, on, a, on this decorated gate at the same time. So it's, yeah, it's clear that something interesting was happening at that point. I think the, the results of the project are going to be interesting to a, a, a quite a wide range of, of people. I mean, we're, we're going to be producing, as I said, the sort of core of the project, uh, the, the core outputs of these 10 critical editions of Sanskrit text. So they will be quite heavily philological um, uh, in, in that, you know, we're having to explain our choices of readings from different manuscripts and so forth. So that's quite technical. Uh, but we will then, in, in addition to those 10 books, they'll be published as books, but they'll be open access, freely available. I'm going to be writing a monograph. I mean, I've written some of it of, on uh, the early stages of Hatha Yoga, so like the 11th to 15th century. Jason's doing it after that. Daniela's doing one on uh, uh, fieldwork, on the anthropological findings. And um, Mark is, is doing an, uh, uh, sort of refining his work on the progression of Hatha Yoga from the 19th into the into the 20th centuries. Um, so I think you'll find, you know, that they should, I hope, will be of interest to scholars, Sanskrit scholars, uh, historians of, of India, of India's, India's religious practices, but also to um, practitioners of yoga today. Um, I mean, I think they'll find some quite surprising things in there. Um, we do see, you know, we see a progression, we see a, a marked change in how yoga is understood and practiced from the beginning of the period that we're focusing on the 11th century up to the, in the text, up to the 18th century. And we really do see uh, precursors to what is now practiced as, as modern yoga. Um, so I think that should be of interest. I mean, uh, you know, authenticity is a, is a difficult subject and problematic, but uh, we're, you know, you know, we're not hung up on authenticity, but if people want to know what is what was going on, and then you can kind of tell what's a 20th century innovation as well. Uh, we can, you know, we'll be able to highlight that in our work. We are also intending to produce. Well, there's going to be a film of the Hatabhyasa Padati, which is the 18th century text with these 112 postures, and I'm intending also to produce like slim down volumes of the texts and translations with more. Uh, general, uh, less scholarly, less philological introduction. So, for a more more general reader, a bit like uh, yeah, this is this is some, something I did ages ago, the Geran Sangita. Um, so, a bit like that, in an easier, more accessible format. So, I think we're going to produce produce those and hopefully start a you know a, a, a library of of yoga texts, which will go on and on and on and just get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, the, the, the end of the project isn't, isn't the end of our yoga studies by any means, hopefully it'll catalyse us to move on to, 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 to more, more things. Yeah. Reactions to the project have, on the whole, been um, very positive. I think everyone's very excited. You know, it's it's such a such a you know, yoga is such a phenomenon now. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think you know, I was when I said in order to get the grant, for example, I got sort of shortlisted. You have to apply, and then you get shortlisted. Then I had to go to Brussels for an interview, and then it's quite intimidating. There's a long table with twenty senior academics around it. Now, normally, apparently, only three or four people ask questions. You know, they've been primed with questions to ask you that reviewers have sent in their comments and questions and then they ask you these things. But when I was in there, everyone wanted to ask a question. Either they practice yoga or their partner practice yoga or they just wanted, you know. So I, I, I could tell that this is a hot, a hot topic. So generally, yeah, people have been very positive, often surprised, actually, that that such a project should get funding. Some people are occasionally dismissive, you know, what yoga, why should we be funding a project on that? But, you know, it's such a, uh, an important big part of, of global civilization. Now, everyone knows about yoga, everyone's practicing, but really, we, you know, we're only just beginning to find out where it came from, how, it's, how it developed, what, what its history is. Um, I think occasionally there's a bit of kickback. You know, I try, to be honest, I try to avoid looking at social media and so forth. But occasionally people get frustrated uh, or annoyed that what we're finding through our research doesn't necessarily match what they've been taught 
is the history of yoga. You know, and if they're within a you know a set lineage that has its kind of understanding of the history of yoga, and yet we're saying, no, hang on. A great example is Surya Namaskar, for example. You know, we have been able to show that there's no no evidence for the practice of Surya Namaskar as it's commonly done today prior to perhaps the 19th century. We really don't know. Actually, there's there's you know. There's, it certainly doesn't appear in any yoga text, that's for sure. In fact, the only time it appears in a yoga text is it's in a commentary in, from the 19th century saying you shouldn't do too many Surya Namaskars because they'll, you know, you'll, you'll hurt your body. And it's kind of it's 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 put together, it's grouped with weightlifting. You know, so occasionally people uh, get frustrated by that. I think also, you know, also we can we as I as I said earlier by showing what yoga was, or from our evidence what it was, that then highlights what is now an innovation. A bit like, I mean, Surya Namaskar is, is, a, is a less clear-cut example, because it's clear that something was going on, up, you know, certainly from the 17th, 18th centuries, we get references to it, and I think it's just people doing prostration and standing up again. Um, but other stuff like these complex sequences you see in some modern yoga traditions, there's no evidence for those whatsoever. Uh, so again, people get a bit frustrated if we point that out. And I had, I was shown something a, a few months ago on Instagram where people were saying, "Oh, you know, these soas people think they've got a monopoly on the history of yoga," but but then they don't have any actual answer to you know, any evidence, any counter evidence to what we're what we're saying. So. I mean, I think that's always the way. It's often the way with with historians. You know, if you you, you bring up things that people don't want you to say. <laughs>
one being that there are more than 200 manuscripts of it around the world, and the other being that it's a compilation, so it takes lots of verses from earlier texts, you know, I think it, about 50% of it we've so far identified as being from earlier texts, and those texts have not been edited, well until now, in fact now, so now through the Hatha Yoga project we've edited most of those earlier texts, so that provides us with a very nice good foundation to produce a good solid edition of the Hatha Pratipika. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm hoping to do. I've also got you know, grand plans for much bigger collaborative projects as well. Um, I think yeah, I'd like to try to do something on yoga and power. Um, in various ways, yoga. I, one, of, there are still some questions. You know, I've answered most of my questions, burning questions that I had about yoga with this project. But there are still some remain, and a difficult one is the translation, the, the transition from yoga being a practice for ascetics to one for householders. You know, one for normal people in the world. Uh, and I've got some ideas on that, but I think they need to be looked into in the big collaborative project because I think it's. It's to do, I think one of the things that facilitated that um, process was patronage of yoga and yogis by kings, by, by royalty or by um, leaders, by political leaders in, in India. Um, I haven't, uh, you can tell I haven't fully fleshed out my ideas on this. I'm going to be putting some of this in my monograph to go with this project, but I think there's a lot of scope to look further into that. As, because I think that is key to understanding that, as I say, the transition of yoga from being something practiced by these wild ascetics who've renounced normal life to it being uh, something that can be practiced by people living in, in the world. The most significant point. Well, I can think of small points. I mean, one an, an exciting discovery of the project that I haven't mentioned so far, uh, which I think will be seen as very significant, is that the first text to teach Hatha Yoga was written by Buddhists, not by Hindus. You know, this is that was a complete surprise to me, a complete shock. A text called the Amrita Siddhi. So that's super exciting. I mean, I, to be honest, as a researcher, you know, unlike people who perhaps want to have their what they've been taught validated, and uh, as I say, people sometimes get frustrated because what we find differs from what they've been taught is the historical tradition. I find nothing more exciting than having to change my mind, you know, that's, that's when it gets fun, you know, when suddenly like, oh my god, this is completely different from what I thought, and then you've got to realign all your thoughts, so that was a, that was a big, big moment, although actually on the subsequent history it doesn't have that big an effect, but the fact is that it was first codified, I mean it set the ball rolling, but then Buddhism dies out in India and it's, it's continued by non non-Buddhist traditions. I think that it'll be remembered certainly for finding that out. Um, I mean I think really what we will be doing, well we did also we'll be demonstrating the importance of really serious philological and ethnographic work uh, to make, to, to truly understand the history of something. You know, could not just yoga more broadly. I mean I think this is a, what concerns me actually is that the, the state of universities, certainly in the UK and I think around the world, uh, everywhere, is that people are not being trained up with the sort of skills that are necessary to do this work anymore. Um, the kind of focus of universities is, is, is changing um, and so that does concern me that people won't be able to do this work in the future. Um, so whether they'll be able to take up, you know, we'll be pointing to, we've pointed towards other texts that could do with being worked on. Um, but yeah, that's that's a hope I have that we're kind of holding a holding a torch for for such good solid uh, academic study. Um, what other key points? Well, also that yoga is not something that's been exactly the same for two, three, four, five hundred thousand years, whatever someone might tell you. You know, it's, it's constantly evolving, and, it, and we see that to this day. Um, otherwise it'd be boring to research it, but you can see that it's, you know, and we've really highlighted how it's, it's changed, you know, every century almost over the last thousand years, there are constant refinements and changes and new, new practices being taken on and so forth, so I hope we have highlighted that. Um, 
also, I think, although I don't know if we'll be getting this across so much in our publications, and it has been done before, Deborah Diamond with her exhibition at the Smithsonian in 2013, but the richness of the art historical material as well. Um, yeah, and so combining the art historical, the ethnographic, the textual material, we show just how how rich and fascinating and uh, complex and constantly changing the, the, the yoga tradition is. What, about yoga or about just generally? What have I learned from this project? Well, I've learned that, you know, I'm the leader of the project as such, you know, it's my idea and I put it together, but as I again mentioned earlier, I've learned that it's, things are very easy when you've got a really good team. <laughs> you don't have to worry too much. You know, this is, a, you know, it's a problem certainly within, within society at large and in, within universities, this kind of managerial culture of having to check everyone and everyone being observed all the time and lots of uh, metrics and so forth I'm I, you know if you trust people you let them get on with it you know if you, you get the best people on board then they'll they'll do great work I think that's um, you know on the in terms of the the, the project itself um, what else have I, have I I mean obviously I've learned huge amounts of specific details about the history of yoga which will be produced in our uh, in our books, personally, um, gosh, I don't know, how has it changed me? I've learned that I thought I would be on five years of research leave and it'd be totally relaxed and I'd be able to get on, but I mean, even, even though I say the, the team don't need managing, but the bureaucracy that goes with the project is quite heavy and trying to maintain my other duties at SERS and so forth, it's been quite tough. Um, it I mean, it's been great been great but it's been hard work that's for sure you know, um, constant and and actually to go back to your earlier question as well you know it's really I've really learned how popular yoga is around the world you know my emails are a nightmare because I'm constantly getting people writing to me saying you know with queries about this and that because they know about the project and they want to ask questions about what we're doing and then often specific things about what they're doing and their yoga practice and so forth so that's been reinforced to me on a I almost feel like I shouldn't say this, but I think I've also come to the conclusion that the gap between modern yoga practice, I mean, these terms are a bit vague, but the gap between, you know, what we find being performed in yoga studios around the world and traditional yoga practice in India is, is even bigger than I thought. <laughs> you know, the, the differences are, are constantly ram, rammed home to me. Um, but I think there's still enough of a connection to justify continuing research that will have some bearing and be of, of interest to people who, who practice yoga around the world today. Yeah. Okay, how did, you know, what did I learn from living with ascetics in India? How did my life change? Well, it changed massively because I wouldn't be here now, I wouldn't be doing this project if it wasn't for it. I mean, it's a lot of fun. I had a gr I've had great great times. You know, I was very lucky that in 1992 I met my guru, who very sadly died uh, a couple of months ago, um, and then spent you know the best part of the next ten years travelling around India with him, um, having a really beautiful time. I mean, it, aesthetically beautiful, spiritually beautiful, intellectually stimulating, um, and so I learned a lot about India. You know. I, one of the things that drives me is, is, is my you know, love of, of, of India and the Indian people, Indian ascetics that I've spent time with and Indian people more broadly, the, the devotees of the ascetics, they're in, in general wonderful people as well. Um, I think, you know, one thing people often, again to go back to this sort of, you know, it's hard to put this into not very many words, but um, People think, you know, you should be able to find things in ancient texts that are of great relevance to, that you can apply to your life now. I don't think that's true, and I think you can say the same. I think, in fact, there's more to be learnt as a person from appreciating differences 
and how many you know how different people are around the world and yet we can still all get on and function together and I think that's the same you know my my guru and the ascetics I live with even though I perhaps you know aspired at times and pretended that I could perhaps be like them no way I mean they live incredibly tough uh, and yet somehow productive lifestyles where their uh, asceticism and their renunciation of the norms of society uh, still manages, you know, produces in them a great kind of charisma and a great um, understanding of the, of, of the world. So that's, you know, that's something I've aspired to and I've learned from, but I'd never hoped to emulate. I mean, I, I did fantasize about it early on, but I've, I, I uh, probably, certainly for the better, um, you know, I've been with my wife now for 30 years and she's, she always stopped me from running off to the forest and becoming an ascetic myself. But um, you know, very, very beautiful times, you know, definitely those times in India, you know, wandering around with, with my guru, definitely the most special times of my life.